I'm John Benson, Vice Chair of the uh, Select Board, and I'd like to welcome and thank you all for attending. Uh, the Town's Master Plan, Act in 2020, is grounded in the roadmap for guiding growth, where the overarching goal um, is to provide more environmental and physical sustainability. The key objective of Act in 2020 are to promote economic development that supports other Act in 2020 planning goals and to increase the town's physical capacity to implement all goals by proactively recruiting new businesses and retaining existing ones throughout the town and to develop a comprehensive, proactive, affordable housing strategy that supports the provisions of a wide range of housing types, including for people of limited financial means. To move the implementation forward, the town applied and was awarded a planning assistance grant in early 2018 from the uh, Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs to explore how we could advance both Act in 2020 objectives. In addition um, to the uh, state grant, the ACHC, with approval from the select board, provided matching funds. So with these funds, the town hired Judy Barrett of Barrett Planning Associates, LLC, who has over 30 years of professional experience in state and local government specializing in economic planning, housing, and real estate consulting. Judy has been working on this project for the town for the last year and a half and is here tonight uh, to present our findings and recommendations. Just some brief updates um, for the group here tonight and the television audience. Um, personally, I'm, I'm very encouraged uh, with some recent developments where we'll be able to thoughtfully approach housing and not be reactive to 40B developers. Um, by the end of the, I believe the end of August, we will receive um, certification from the Department of uh, Housing and Community Development um, for a housing production, two, a housing production plan two-year um, safe harbor with an effective date of uh, July 19, 2019. And we expect to reach the 10% 40B threshold early next year and we should be in striking distance of the reset number coming out of the 2020 census, which should be known the latter part of, of, of 2021. So with that update, I'd like to introduce uh, Ms. Judy Barrett. Thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you all for coming out on a beautiful summer night uh, to hear this presentation. Let me just tell you a little bit about myself and kind of my approach to this project. Um, I've been in the field for 34 years, most of it as a consultant. Um, I started out my career as a department head for the town of Plymouth in the community development and planning division and spent about four years there. I worked for state government as well, um, administering a pretty large grant program for, uh, for cities and towns in Massachusetts, uh, focusing on community development. So part of it was housing, part of it was economic development, some of it was around public facilities for, uh, for small communities. And then from there, I went into the consulting world and have stayed there ever since. Um, Acton is not new to me. I worked on a project here in the early 2000s under a different grant, and so it was kind of delightful to come back and see all the good things that have happened in this community since the last time I was here. So with that, I will just kind of, you know, enter this discussion by saying my perspective as a planner, um, having been in this field for a long time, is that communities that are healthy places offer a lot of choices. They offer choices for what people do for work and where and how they live, um, and that's how they thrive. And that's typically what I kind of look at when I come into one of these projects. So if you just kind of bear that in mind, I think you'll hear more about that point of view as I go through um, these slides. Um, I'll point out that as I talk, um, the staff of the planning department will be uh, going around with some cards to give everybody a card. And what we would like you to do, if you have a question while I'm doing a presentation, if you could write the question down, 
and you'll give the cards to Kristen um, when I'm done, and she'll go through them. And it's just a time management issue. So she'll go through the questions, and we'll try to answer all of them uh, while I'm here. And if we can't do that, um, I'll provide written answers to the planning department, and they can post them, I assume, online. Is that how you would like to do it? OK. So I've done my introduction. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the order of this presentation. I want to talk a bit about the context uh, for the study and kind of what the questions were that we were trying to answer as part of our work, uh, much of which really kind of begins with sort of a profile of the community, uh, really updating a lot of the information that was in your Act in 2020 plan, which in turn updated information from a previous plan that I and others had worked on. Um, this, about half the study is about sort of the economic development situation in Acton, and about half of it is about housing. And the bigger question is sort of how do these things come together, if at all? Um, and so part of what we did in, in this project was to, um, to conduct what's called a SWOT, which is a, an assessment of a community's strengths and weaknesses and its assets and liabilities, and try to figure out kind of what the, what the real strengths are of the town. My experience as a planner is that when communities are going to try to embark on any sort of agenda, any kind of strategy, they're always going to build on their strengths. So it's very important to understand strengths. Oftentimes in a planning study, people come to a meeting or to a, a process with all their gripes. And you have to sort of let people air those things. But in the end, what really matters the most is what's going well in a community. Because those are the things that people are going to build on. So I spent a lot of time just trying to understand what's going, going well. And then I want to talk a little bit about some best practices in the field um, from a housing and an economic development perspective uh, of what other communities are doing, kind of regional organizations, kind of what's going on in the field of planning for housing and planning for economic development so that people um, may maybe have some ideas um, of things that perhaps they would like to consider for Acton uh, in the future. And as I said, we'll leave time for some questions at the end. So just to be clear what our scope of work was, because I think there's been some misinformation about that, um, just to be clear, I think there was early on a perception that we were here as somehow a marketing firm or promotions, and that's not who we are, we're planners. So we were asked, first of all, to do an assessment um, of the town's kind of economic development capacity using a tool that was developed by Northeastern University several years ago called the EDSAT, which is the Economic Development Self-Assessment Tool. Um, which we did use, um, however, the EDSAT program has pretty much uh, closed because the person who designed it left Northeastern and went elsewhere. So we did not have access to the rich databases that Northeastern had, but what we did have, fortunately, was the EDSAT reports from a number of communities that are so sort of similar to Acton. And so we were able to kind of draw on those in, in, in an effort to sort of put Acton in a, a competitiveness um, context. There's a lot of data analysis. There's always data analysis that goes on in planning. We looked at the sort of employment base here, the economic base, um, kind of the wage structure of your economic base here. What does housing cost? What's happening with the housing market? Um, and then also looking at things like just commuting patterns. It's a pretty good question that many of us try to ask when we start anything in economic development, which is where do your workers come from and where you, where's your labor force going? So you have a sense of, you know, do the people who live in a community have opportunities to, to do the kind of work that they're trained to do, or do they go elsewhere for some other reasons, either because there aren't enough jobs or the wage structure isn't really adequate to support ones uh, living in the community in which they, you know, where they reside. We also looked at kind of the organizational capacity of the town, and by that I mean kind of who's doing what. What kind of committee structure do you have? What kind of staff support do you have? How do people all kind of work together? on these really related questions, which, you know, I don't know if you're aware of it, but there's really been quite a push in Massachusetts for the last couple of years, coming from the governor's office for, for communities to look more carefully at the economic development implications of their housing policies. So naturally we look at that as well um, and try to understand kind of how those two worlds come together. Because in some communities they come together very well and in other communities they don't. Um, and then we conducted best practices research. I'm just going to touch on a few examples of that this evening um, and recommendations as well. So that was sort of the overall scope of our, of our work. We took that scope and tried to articulate um, a set of questions that really guided the way we chose to focus on the project. And, and one was, I think, probably the most important question any planner would ask coming into a community, which is, what does your master plan say? So we looked at the master plan from a land use perspective, from an economic development perspective, a housing perspective, and said, how well equipped is this community 
to implement the housing and economic development goals and objectives and policies that are articulated in that plan. Because naturally, we would not want to be doing a plan that runs really far astray from the town's master plan. That would be kind of bad planning. Another question we asked was, to what extent are your employment base and your labor force characteristics aligned? So just to be clear, because I'm going to start throwing some terms around, your employment base is comprised of the jobs that are in your community. Your labor force is your residents who work. So some residents work locally, and they are both in the labor force and part of your employment base. Residents who work elsewhere are part of your labor force, but they're not part of your employment base. So just to kind of just to make sure people understand those two terms. We looked at what's happening regionally that might be sort of opportunities or challenges for the town in terms of addressing, again, the goals and policies for economic development and housing that are in Act in 2020, which is the name of your comprehensive plan. And then, you know, to what extent are those goals and policies in sync? Are they going in different directions? Are they related in some way? Do, are they mutually supporting? Um, you know, do these things kind of fit together in a good way? in a good way, because if they're not, then it makes it really hard, I think, for a town to accomplish anything in their plan, because they're going, people going in opposite directions. Um, and then what best practices are there in community development in your town today, because you're going to build on your strengths. It's just the way this work happens. And are there opportunities to build an even stronger economy and provide for housing equity um, that your leadership can support? So I know the lights may make this a little bit difficult, but you can probably tell, looking at these icons, that some are dark and some are not. And the gradient is simply an indicator of where we landed in term, after we did all this analysis, that you're sort of equipped to, to implement some of the goals and policies from your plan. You're, you're s sort of in line to a point in terms of the composition of your labor force and the composition of your employment base. There's a lot going on regionally to build on, so that's a darker icon. Your economic development and housing goals are not in sync. I don't think that's a surprise to anybody here. They're not in very good sync, let me put it that way. So that's a lighter color. And then your best practices, you know, there's a lot to build on here, which is good. So I I'm trying to suggest to you that there's more good coming out of this than kind of a critique. Um, but those, this is sort of, a, these are the questions we were trying to pursue. So a little bit about the context. I'm not going to bore you with a lot of data. I just sort of want to um, you know, give you a flavor for the report. We looked at location and to what extent does that create opportunities or constraints for economic development and housing. The demographics, updated demographics for the town. What is the regional economy like? For purposes of this report, we defined region as kind of the upper, the northernmost communities in the 495 Metro West Partnership area. So if you picture kind of Route 2, 495, the sort of northern stretch of that up to Westford, that was kind of what we considered the geographic region. And we looked at regional development trends um, kind of within that general area, and then also the state policy framework. And I'll tell you that, um, excuse me, it's just moving too fast. Um, these are the communities in that blue circle that we looked at as the geographic context for the town. But we looked at more than geography, because my experience is, if you're really trying to get a sense of where you are relative to your peers, the communities with which you may compete for, um, for employment, for employment possibilities, it's not always directly geographic. There are also communities that are sort of similar to you, perhaps within eastern Massachusetts, that may have enough characteristics like yours that they might be seen as kind of a plausible peer group. And the towns that are listed up here are, for the most part, communities that should look familiar to many of you, because these are communities that you tend to use as a town, either for financial benchmarks or education benchmarks. So for example, if you're public schools, you're looking at other school districts that you consider to be roughly similar, you would probably not be surprised to see some of these communities on the list. By contrast, if you are following financial benchmarks, um, which many communities do, and you've been on the Finance Committee, some of the towns up here probably would not surprise you. So this is sort of a combination of kind of those two sources. And we said, what communities are sort of worth looking at to understand the things that make Acton competitive and perhaps not so competitive? What are these other communities that are kind of enough like you that they may be doing things that either could be 
uh, a good lesson for you or things that might be, might be creating some constraints for you because they're doing a better job or maybe places that aren't doing as good a job as you. But groups that overall, demographically, would be worth looking at. So we looked at two types of communities. One is geography and one is peer group. And this was mainly for the economic development side of the project, but clearly, as long as we were looking at all these other places, we were trying to get a handle on what was going on with, with housing as well, and in particular, how the housing and economic development folks are working together. No surprise, you know, you're a sub-regional hub, you have that kind of quality about you, you're an affluent suburb in a very affluent region, um, which is a, you know, just, I, I, probably a strength and a weakness to some extent as well, but here you are, you're an affluent community, so that's going to, to dictate certain things about the kind of economy that you have. It's also going to create some issues around the kind of housing choices that you offer. You're an activist community. Every time I come to work in Acton, there's like always people very involved in government and community affairs here, which is a good thing. I always consider that a real strength in a community because what it tells me is people really care. Um, you're a place that's dealing with a lot of challenges that we see in other communities, you are not alone in many of the things that you're dealing with here. And you're a town that, at least in my experience as a planner, does a lot of things really, really well. Um, and in all, you have opportunities to do some things even better than you do today. But there's a lot of good here, which is, I'm sure you all know. So this is just like a little snapshot of your employment base. I don't know how hard it is for you to read this, but let me tell you what this is. This is a list of the types of industries that are represented in your employment base. Uh, retail, wholesale, um, you know, construction trades, agriculture. These industries are all represented in the employer establishments in your community. And what the table tells you is how many employers are in these different industries and then how many jobs are represented by those employers. The table also tells you what the sort of average wage is for that industry in the business, in the employers that are in your community. And then the last column is something called a location quotient. And a location quotient is something that planners and economists look at to try to get a snapshot of what is strong or maybe not so strong about the employment base in your community. Now I'll tell you these numbers can sometimes be a bit deceptive. A very, very high location quotient, which might be something like 5.0, might look really great, that's a very strong industry. It also could suggest that you're a one company town. So we have to be a little bit careful when we look at these, but essentially what the location quotient does is it affords us a way to compare the structure of your economy to the structure of some larger reference economy. It could be the state, it could be a county, it could be a metro area. We typically look at location quotients in two ways. One is the sort of metro area of which you're a part, and the other is the state. And the reason we do that is that if we looked only as sort of a state comparison, we might think that something is uniquely strong in your town when in fact it might be strong regionally and unless you look at a sort of a regional comparison, you wouldn't know. A good example of this is that when I work in Central Mass, I always see very high location quotients for agriculture. They're not so high if I'm comparing a town in Central Massachusetts to Worcester County but it looks very high if I'm comparing a town in, in, West, in central Massachusetts to the state as a whole. So we always look at kind of two of these and try to get a sense of what is the nature of the regional economy and then what is the nature of Acton. So we look at this both ways. So the numbers that are in red up here are the industries that tend to be sort of stronger in your economy than perhaps they are in, in a larger kind of reference economy. And by that I mean your, a larger percentage of your jobs are comprised of jobs in these industries than say perhaps for the state as a whole. So I think unsurprisingly, you have a fairly high location quotient in manufacturing, in retail trade, in information services, professional technical services, arts and entertainment and recreation, and this category called other services, which is everything from public safety to, uh, to domestic assistance um, to people. It's just, it's a big catch-all. So those are industries where you tend to be kind of strong relative to a larger region. And the ones that I didn't mention are a lot of other industries that are also represented here, but maybe not quite such a strong contributor to the employment base. So you have a, a number of sectors that are pretty strong. And for the most part, the industries where you're strong tend to pay relatively high wages. That's not true for retail, it's not true for arts and entertainment, but the other industries tend to pay pretty, pretty, pretty good wages. 
manufacturing information professional services. So that's a good thing. But then there's this other side, side of it, and that is that the highest paying industries that you have in your town comprise 25% of the entire employment base. So only 21% of the people who live in your community actually work here in terms of jobs. Not included in these statistics are people who are self-employed because the employment data that, re that represent sort of industrial employment do not include self-employment. We also look at that. But this data set doesn't happen to represent that. Um, so 21% of the people who live in your community have a payroll job somewhere in Acton, and the rest of them are going somewhere else. Um, the town is, at least from all the interviews that we did here, and all the information we picked up along the way, not always able to meet what I would consider the reasonable expectations of local businesses. Um, the town's economic identity is not very clear. You have high housing costs. And what we found in our work on this project was that basic data that I know economic development organizations and other communities have at their disposal, right away you ask for it, they've got it, was not available here. So, you know, there's good things here, but then in terms of trying to sort of manage the economic development process, there's this basic data that you really need to have. Um, and this is just a little bit of a, a sort of other ways of thinking about the data that I just talked about. You have these, way, you have these industries that tend to pay, um, you know, sort of higher wages and also have quite a bit of jobs. Your labor force is comprised of a somewhat different mix. No, it's not surprising that people are leaving the community to go to work elsewhere. And then this bar chart at the bottom is just a comparison against your peer group, not your geographic group, your peer group, of what, how, what the percentage of local residents is that's working locally. And yours is pretty low. You are the third one in on, from, the, from, from the left on, on my side. And so you're pretty low, you're 20.4%. 20, 20 Compared with your peer group, that's, that's probably not a good thing. And it's probably something you're gonna want to look at as you think about what kind of economy are we trying to develop in this community. We did a couple of surveys. We had a wonderful meeting with a number of local employers back in January. We have talked to 24 other businesses on our own uh, in town. And so there are some things we kind of heard along the way that really are very similar to data that come out of the federal census. So that helps me kind of think that there's some validity in some of the census numbers we see. And, you know, and so what this is just simply a question we asked employers, how many of the people who work for you actually come from Acton? And no surprise, you know, it was less than 25% was, is the largest circle in this graph. So the bigger the circle, you know, the, the fewer the people who are actually living, you know, living and working in, in Acton together. Most of them are drawing their employees from outside the town. And some people would say that's not an issue. You have to decide whether it is. I'm just simply here to tell you that relative to your peer group, you have a low percentage of people staying here every day. And that has implications for for really all of the businesses in your community. Um, it also has implications for thinking about the challenges that your businesses may have finding employees. So this, these two bar charts compare industries two ways. One is what's your employment base made up, and the other is your labor force. And I think you can kind of see, we've tried to organize this so that it's easy to compare them. The colors of the labor force and the colors of the employment base are not well aligned. So it's really not a surprise that a lot of people are leaving the community every day. You have some challenges for economic development. No surprise, I think you kind of know most of this. You have infrastructure constraints here that probably make it difficult to do some of the kind of economic growth that you would like to see, um, at least based on what you said in Act in 2020 that you wanna have for your local economy. Employee recruitment appears to be an issue here and in many of the towns I've worked in, it is an Eastern Massachusetts problem. A little bit later in this presentation, I'm gonna talk about what some companies are doing to try to get the young employees that everybody says they want um, because it's hard. Um, and so it's an issue here. We heard this from almost every business, every employer, including nonprofits that we spoke with. Their transportation and mobility constraints, it's kind of hard if most of your employment base is coming from outside the town to sort of get here every day when you're not really part of a main um, public transportation system um, where you have frequent runs and so forth. It's like your, your public transportation system tends to be sort of 
Boston-oriented, where a lot of your workers are coming from along and west of 495. There are tensions here about growth and change. I don't think that's any surprise. I think every affluent community I work in wants to keep what they have, and you can't blame people. The reality is, however, that as we stand here, or sit here in your case this evening, there are people who own property in Acton who are making decisions about what they're going to do with it. And so being kind of attuned to the fact that change is going to take place, whether you want it or not, it's going to happen. How do you get the best that you can for your community out of the change that's going to come, whatever that change might be? Um, and then the other thing that I think is a challenge here is just generally communication. If you caught on my cover slide the tagline for the entire project, which is communicate, uh, cooperate, and collaborate, it is, it is the theme that uh, you're going to hear from me from time to time throughout this presentation. And it actually came from the local employers I spoke with that people are yearning to have a relationship with town government that's, that's clear communication, a sense of a collaborative partner, um, a sense of kind of cooperation are things that I heard over and over again people would really like to see more of in the community. Um, so communication, I think, is challenging here, at least in my experience. So, you know, why does anybody even care about this? Because I can tell you, um, as one who's been in this field for a long time, we're losing our young workers. I don't think this is a big shock to anybody in this room. Young people are going elsewhere because the jobs are elsewhere, because the kind of lifestyle they want to live is elsewhere, because the affordability of housing is elsewhere. So daytime population counts in the United States are shifting geographically. They're not as much here as they are in the South, in the Southwest, and the Far West. People are, people are, are leaving. So we have to really think as a state and as individual communities strategically about how do we keep our, our workers so that we have the kind of economy that we, we say we want to have. This is not just Acton. It's really kind of a statewide issue. How do we compete? Do we choose to compete for the kind of economy that we want or not? And that's a question for you. I'm just here to really tell you if you do want to compete, then there are things you need to work on. One of the things that, um, that was striking to me in working on this project was just how much retail spending is being leaked to other jurisdictions from your town. This is a chart that takes kind of the different types of uh, retail and consumer spending that people do on a daily basis, weekly basis, and tells you what dollars you're keeping locally and what dollars are going somewhere else. So when you look at this chart, anything that's kind of on the, the left, as you're looking at it, um, those are retail expenditures that are pretty much staying here. Those are kind of strong, those are, those are stronger. So the leakage is on the other side of the chart. Most of the retail spending that your consumers are doing are not happening in Acton. Part of that is because most people aren't working here every day. <laughs> so this is just a phenomenon that we tend to see in communities where there's a lot of employment leakage, there's also spending leakage. That creates some challenges for, you know, for your local business community, and it's not just the retailers. It really is kind of a, um, an indicator, if you will, of just another aspect of what makes uh, employment recruitment and retention hard in a place like this. If there's not a lot for people to do, they'll go spend their money somewhere else, and they'll go work somewhere else. No surprise that you're an educated town as part of a very educated part of the state. Uh, these towns that are in these different colors up here are all part of that peer group that we talked about. Just looking at how you are in relation to, to the rest of the state, these sort of affluent communities that comprise uh, the west of Boston suburbs and the communities around Route 495 tend to be fairly educated communities. And so people have choices. Um, and the competition for jobs is that much harder because the business the people have choices about where they're going to work and they have high expectations too you know one of the neat things about working in towns like yours is that people have very high expectations of government they have high expectations of the kind of community that they live in that to me is a strength but it's also you know a bit of a glass of cold water in your face when you realize that people may want things that that would be harder to get precisely because of the kind of community they, they want to stay um, so you have this affluence on the one hand, but then you also have significant differences in wealth in this community. Um, your average income is in the top 20%. Um, you receive, the middle, middle fifth of the earners in your town receive 36% of what the top income earners receive, you know, annually. So there is a, an in income distribution issue here, and I don't think there's any surprise to the housing people that this exists. 
Um, your average income in the middle 20% of earners is 125,168. Your incomes are high here. This is no big surprise. And that creates an issue for housing. It also creates an issue for the kinds of jobs that people are going to seek in order to be able to support this kind of lifestyle. Um, the, one of the data sets that economics, economics folks look at um, kind of takes your households and breaks them into different types of groups in order to understand the way people live, the kinds of incomes they uh, rely upon to live a certain lifestyle, and kind of how they compare nationally. So this entity called Esri, uh, which is a national um, geographic information systems firm, uh, with census data and other data sets, can kind of give a profile of your households based on their income and where they live and kind of how they live. Their spending, it's fascinating stuff. So according to Esri, 36% of your households are like 1.6% of the nation's households. And this is this group called kind of professional pride. These are you know, people who are professionally employed, who have very high education. Um, you have a lot of them nationally, not so many. So it's, these are just ways to think about how different your community is. 28.4% of your households are like 1.3% of the nation's. That's the sort of urban chic. These are kind of the younger professional people. I know these terms are kind of silly, but that's what, that's what they are. 22% of your households are like 4.6%, which is this sort of top tier, super high earning. This statistic um, is off the charts in Lexington. So you can probably picture, you guys are really wealthy, but there are even towns that are where this extreme is even greater. Um, and then 15% of your households, kind of enterprising professionals, uh, are like about 6% of the nation. So you have a lot of households here with very high expectations, high educations, and, and a need for high incomes in order to live in your community. And it's quite different from the sort of national profile of households. There are household types that aren't even listed for Acton because you don't have them. So your profile is very similar to greater Boston. Generally, many of your affluent suburbs in Boston are kind of similar to you. Um, relocation of young workers um, with variety of skills to other regions in the United States is playing a significant role in Massachusetts demographics because there are household types that simply are not even found in this community. I want to move now to this EDSAT, this Economic Development Self-Assessment Tool, because this was a really interesting process to go through. The EDSAT, which was developed by a program at Northeastern University, looks at a variety of indicators of economic success or strengths um, and asks you a bunch of questions about kind of where you fall in these different categories. So one is just about how accessible are you, you know, your access to customer markets. What, are, what kinds of businesses and industries are in your community? Um, what's the real estate market here? What's the infrastructure that you offer to uh, economic development? What's the, fact, what's the situation with the labor force in your community and regionally? And how does that sort of support or not support different types of industries? How does your permitting process work? What's the quality of life in your community? What kind of amenities do you offer to workers? This is becoming a bigger and bigger conversation in economic development is what are you offering your workers? Because workers will go where they can find things to do. They will go places where they can play, where I, I hate live, work, and play, but I mean that kind of idea that, that people have things that they can do both during the workday and after work. What do you offer your workers? Because if you're not offering them uh, the kind of lifestyle that they're looking for, it becomes harder for employers to recruit them. Um, what business incentive do you offer, if any? Um, you know, how do your local tax rates look, your water rates, your sewer rates if you have, uh, you know, public sewer? And then how easy is it to get information? So these are the categories the EDSAT looks at. The EDSAT is a way for a community to look at itself and say, gee, we're good at this, we're not so good at this, these are things that perhaps we could do better, and here are things that are really strong. So it's not really so much that someone comes in and does a checklist, it's rather asking a community, how are you doing? Within those categories, there are things that really matter from an economic development point of view. Access, parking, traffic, infrastructure, rents, workforce composition, how quickly approvals happen in the permitting process, and your website, which may surprise some people, but it is becoming a bigger and bigger issue. How, easy can I get inf how easily can I get information? The second tier of things that count uh, in terms of economic competitiveness are public transportation, how much cross-marketing is taking place between industries. Is your permitting predict system predictable? 
Not that everybody gets a yes, but rather can I anticipate what the answer is going to be? Because if I think what I want to do is going to be a no, I'm probably not going to spend the money on it. But if I think I can get to a yes if I do X, Y, and Z, then I'm going to go ahead and maybe try. But predictability is the issue, not the easy guess, but the, the easy answer, yes or no. Fast track permitting, is, is, is the permitting process quick? Um, are there housing choices for workers? What amenities do you offer? What kind of land or buildings do you have available for economic growth? And what's the quality and the uh, makeup of your public schools? So these are all things that we look at. And some of these, this is sort of the, the second tier of important things. And the other, the top tier was the ones I mentioned on the previous slide. What came out of the, the EDSAT program before it officially closed down was this understanding that, because the program went on for quite a while, that economic development has become a lot less about offering lower costs of production than about a high quality of life and community assets that attract and retain innovative firms and their workers. This means that strategies should provide for quality, housing, for neighborhoods, mobility, education, and health and cultural facilities. So the way we think about economic development today is very different from the way people thought about it 25 years ago. We used to think about economic development as how many businesses did you bring in this year? We're much more attuned today to what kind of environment are we offering the businesses that we're trying to get so we can keep them. So if we can't keep businesses, we're gonna have a hard time getting more. Challenges here in the EDSAT process were getting the information, um, which either didn't exist or it wasn't known. Um, information that really, to an economist, is basic stuff. Um, how does Acton develop its economy and promote itself to employers without that basic information? Um, project purposes and goals were not as well understood as I think they could have been. It would have helped us with this project, I think, early on. Um, difficulty understanding the value and use of kind of taking stock. Why would you do this? Well, I think every organization that's trying to do strategic planning stops once in a while and looks at itself, no matter what the topic is. I think sometimes that was hard for people to understand why would you even do this. And, and also, I would say, I think the economic development and housing nexus that is very well understood outside this community is not well understood here, or at least it doesn't appear to be. And I think it's something you're going to need to look at. Relative to your peer group, your comparison group, um, you have highway access challenges. None of this is going to surprise any of you, I think. You have adequate parking in most locations. Your generally com uh, competitive non-residential rents, except retail, is somewhat high, based on the information we were able to get. There are infrastructure limitations here. Um, several other peer group communities also have infrastructure limitations. Um, you don't have a, a super varied workforce here, substantially comprised of commuters from the north and west. Um, permitting seems generally efficient. We actually heard a fair amount of compliments about the permitting process, like planning board and zoning board of appeals. A lot of concerns about inspections, and I'll get to that. Um, and some concern that there's a lot of discretion in the zoning. Um, kind of hard sometimes to know whether you really could get to a yes. And then the website is, is very weak. Uh, as a communication device, it's very weak. Uh, public transportation primarily serves non-employment, I mean, non-local employment centers, so it makes it hard for you to kind of get your workers here. Um, we didn't find any evidence of cross-marketing. The permitting seems largely discretionary because you have so many things that require a special permit, sometimes with multiple boards. Um, you've created affordable housing here. The town's done a noble job with this but it's mainly in the sort of 40B level pricing and you need to be thinking more about a broader pricing spectrum with your affordable housing agenda, in my opinion. Limited inventory of vacant land, but there are redevelopment options here. Um, you have some amenities, but they're not concentrated around employment nodes. Workers don't wanna have to get in their car to go and get lunch, not, not younger workers, not the workers we're trying to, to keep in our state so they don't go south. You have an excellent public school system here, but limited voc ed opportunities. And one of the things that we're seeing statewide, especially concentrated in Eastern Mass, especially concentrated in wealthy communities like yours, is just the difficulty of finding people in the trades. Um, I've heard stories in places like Weston about there used to be a plumber who lived in town and now there isn't one at all. So, you know, these are just challenges. Um, so how does housing relate to any of this? I've kind of talked a lot about economic development. We know in planning that, the, that housing, uh, both in choices and affordability and pricing, is contributing to the, to the challenge for workforce development, for workforce retention here. Um, we've had a higher rate of household formations 
than we have had housing production. And sometimes people think, well, we have population growth that's out of control, and that's not what it's about at all. As, as a person who does a lot with housing, I don't really pay much attention to population trends, but I pay a lot of attention to household trends because households drive the demand for housing. So things have contributed to the household formation rates that sometimes people don't stop and think about. Um, I happen to have nine children. And when we were all part of one household, we were one household. We are now 11 households. And so, you know, just the children growing up and, and forming their own households created demand for housing. The other thing that's driving household formation rates is divorce. Um, people often ask me, who's living in rental housing today? I've done a lot of studies of the apartment developments in eastern Massachusetts. And one of the things we find is that there are a fair number of divorced parents who are trying to stay in the same town with their kids. So when they were all together, they were one household. They get a divorce, now they're two households. And you'll find a dad or a mom living in an apartment development because their kids are down the street in the house and they don't want to be far away from them. These kinds of conditions com com cumulatively create a demand for housing that we have not kept pace with. And so when the supply gets this out of whack with demand, guess what happens? The prices go up and they become unattainable for many people. People make housing choices for a wide variety of reasons. Some of it is just personal priorities. Some of it has to do with family and relationships. Um, you know, space needs, people's space needs change as they, I, I'm told that space needs change as they get older. That hasn't happened to me yet, but I'm hoping that it does. Um, you know, housing costs certainly relate to how people make housing choices. What kind of lifestyle do you want to have? Um, and where is the housing located? Uh, I found myself at a planning board meeting in another town last night where it just so happens that a couple of young people have been elected to the planning board. And all they can talk about is getting more multifamily housing down the street so they can actually have a place to go and get an ice cream cone because there's nothing to do. So it's funny how I think a different age demographic sort of recognize the ways in which housing relates to the opportunities that then become available in a community when you have enough for the critical mass to support small businesses. Um, your housing costs here are clearly out of, you know, out of whack with what might be considered a more affordable demographic. Um, you are the second town up on that list. You're the one that's in the red band. That's just a picture of median housing, monthly housing costs, and here's $2,054 a month, which, you know, to some of you in this room probably seems like nothing, but I can tell you to a young worker that's a lot. The... Um, you know, the, the graph down at the bottom of the chart is just a comparison of median income by tenure, which means homeowners tend to have a certain kind of income, renters have another. It's not uncommon for the renter household income to be a bit lower. And you can kind of see in, you're the second one in. So, um, so your renter occupied income is the blue and your owner occupied income is the yellow. So homeowners are the yellow and people who are renting apartments are the blue. And there's a pretty significant gap there. So you would find a gap in every town. That's what this chart's telling you. There is a difference everywhere. But people who rent also work. <laughs> and so we need to be thinking about how do we house our workers with the variety of types of businesses that exist in our communities and our region. I found myself asking, what kind of housing do acting workers even need? And nobody seems to know. Um, you know, most towns in Massachusetts have some kind of a housing trust or housing partnership. And they place all their housing creation efforts on 40B. I do a lot of work out of state. They don't talk about 40B out of state. You never, you never hear it, thank God. Um, but you know, in here in Massachusetts, that's been the real focus because, sorry, I went to that too fast. That's become the real focus because everybody's trying to get to 10%. And you can understand why that's the case. But sometimes it leads to just choices about housing policy that are not necessarily well aligned with other aspects of community planning. So it's something to think about. Um, you know, employers and employees really need to be at the table to talk about housing policy here. But I think as long as you have this sort of split that seems to exist in Acton between the economic development folks and the housing folks, you're gonna have a hard time getting all those folks at the table, and they need to be. I like to show this chart and the, and the one that follows just to give people a, a little refresher about what it means to be a worker and what it means to have housing that you can actually afford. So these numbers in this table are income limits that define eligibility for affordable housing. And the US Department of Housing and Development, Urban Development reports these as three different groups. All you need to know for purposes of this presentation is the 50% number is 
is pretty low income. The 30% number is really low income, and the 80% is kind of a moderate income level. So people typically talk about the household of four income. I don't want to talk about the household of four. I want to talk about the household of one, the young worker that we're trying to get into our communities. So if I'm, a, um, if I'm an entry-level paralegal, I've just finished a paralegal program, I'm not married, I'm on my own, I can expect at entry level to make about $40,000 a year. That's gonna be my income. So I'm eligible for affordable housing. Um, if I'm on the far, far right, you're far right, um, if I'm a speech pathologist, I just finished grad school, I'm on my own, I don't have kids, I don't have a husband, or, or a wife, as the case may be, um, I'm probably gonna make about $61,000, my entry level job. And if I'm the person who serves you coffee in the morning, if I'm lucky enough to actually have 52 weeks a year of income and working full time, um, you know, or I'm a cashier, say, in a store, my entry level job is probably gonna be about $22,000 a year. That assumes I've got full time wages and I'm working year round. So that's kind of, I wanna put a face and a job next to these income limits. Sometimes people assume that anybody who's eligible for affordable housing must be re really poor and not working, and it's simply not true. These are real jobs, real people, single people, a household of one. So what can they afford? Well, if I'm that young paralegal, um, and I'm on my own, I can afford about $1,000 a month in rent. I'm not talking about student loans, I'm not talking about transportation costs, I'm not including any of that, I'm just talking about my housing cost. If I'm that young speech pathologist who just finished school, I can afford about $1,500 a month, 1560. If I'm a cashier in an entry level job, I can afford 620. These are real workers. So what you actually have in your community that's available to this, this workforce um, is about 22% of your total renter occupied inventory might be available or at least affordable to that entry level paralegal. And about 58% of your rental inventory probably would be affordable if they can get their hands on it to the young speech pathologist. 10% of your, your housing that's renter occupied would be affordable to someone who's an entry level cashier. I don't know how many of you go grocery shopping, but I do, a lot. And somebody checks out my groceries every time I go grocery shopping. The town has done so much in housing. You probably are aware a couple of years ago, Acton won a, you know, a, a housing, uh, housing Hero Award uh, from the Mass Housing Partnership. When I worked here in 2003 and 2004, you had 177 units on the subsidized housing inventory. Uh, as of July last year, you had 568 units. I know I need to update that number. <laughs> I forgot to do it again. But that's a, that's a big jump, that's a lot. Um, however, you know, there's another side to the story, and it is, for example, while you've been increasing the supply of affordable housing, you know, you've, acted, you've also added about 900 new housing units, so there's been a fair amount of housing growth here. You've permitted about another 472 since 2010, since, in other words, since the last census. Successful advocacy comes with a price. When you look at the last master plan act in 2020, people were asked what would they like to see more of in Acton, no surprise. 83% of the respondents said more open space. 74% um, uh, said protection of historic resources. And 41% said affordable housing. Businesses in Massachusetts are very concerned about the housing issue because they're having trouble getting workers. Um, so there's been a really a sort of a regional effort in eastern Massachusetts uh, with the governor involved as well in trying to get economic development people, local officials like many of you in this room, to start to look squarely at the ways in which our communities either help or hinder the production of housing for our workforce. Um, Cape Cod 5, I don't know how many of you know anything about the Cape, but I do because I work there a lot. Cape Cod 5 just spent $43 million on a new campus in Hyannis. It has a, a walking trails, it has uh, you know, coffee shops and cafeteria and little shops built in. People can come in to shop there or workers can shop there. They built this campus around the assumption that to keep workers, they have to offer something better than a building with a roof on it and a parking lot. And so it's an amenity-rich building. 
and it's kind of a big deal on the Cape because you don't may or may or may not know this, but the Cape has had a lot of trouble retaining workers. So it's, it is a particular issue there, but it's not just the Cape. If you drive up 128 and you look at the redevelopment that's happened in a lot of places off of Route 128, um, you'll see employers that have invested heavily in trying to amenitize their workplaces because that's what it's taking to keep young workers. The Reebok facility in Canton, which was beautiful, had this track, it was gorgeous, it was built for workers, they went to the Seaport District because they have to amenitize where they, what the places that they offer their workers. So this is kind of a trend, and when you're thinking about economic development, think not only about the kind of the businesses you want to have, but what do they need to have their employees? Because that's what's going to drive the ability to keep businesses uh, in all of our communities. It's not just acting. We had a wonderful meeting in January. Um, the planning department helped to organize this. It was a really interesting meeting with, a, I don't know, se several employers. I'm not remembering exactly how many there were. But we had this employers roundtable in January. We did a, a, a number of interviews, as I said, about 24, 25 businesses we spoke with, and then a number of staff meetings. And we're trying to get input on what's going on here. Um, and I think one of the things that, that we learned, no surprise, I think, maybe to many of you, is that employers are saying they're having trouble finding workers. And it's not just whether people are qualified, it's just finding workers. They all talk about the lack of sub-regional transportation as a real problem for employment development here because you can't get your workers here. There seems to be, however, interestingly, uh, just kind of an indirect awareness of the role that housing supply pays in trying to keep workers and attract workers. Because if you don't have a sub-regional transportation system, then you need to deal with the fact that somewhere how people have to live. So this is that connection that I think the governor and many of our statewide housing and economic development organizations have begun to look at is that the money doesn't exist to, develop, to build the transportation system that you would like. So how do you house workers? Um, we heard many, many businesses say town inspections are slow, inconsistent, and bureaucratic, and in most cases, their only contact with town hall, which was a very striking thing that, to, to me. There didn't seem to be really much awareness at all of anything outside the fact that we have to deal with inspections personnel. Employers here, public, nonprofit, for profit, yearn for a relationship with town hall. They want a better relationship with the, with the government. Um, they feel that the town doesn't really understand the way businesses operate and how they need to operate. There's, they just feel like better communication would kind of help everybody. And I can tell you from the interviews that we had, attention from town hall really matters to employers. It's not a small matter. It matters to them when someone from town hall, aside from an inspector, walks into their establishment and says, what do you do? How are you doing? You know, uh, how are things going for you? Is business good here? Is it not so well? Who works for you? And really begins to understand the situation in which that business operates. We did a target industries assessment as part of this project. Target industries is kind of where are your likely successes in terms of just the types of industries that you might be able to bring more of into your community. And they're not, I don't think this is really too much of a big surprise, professional services, uh, management of companies, which is a particular type of industry, the creative economy, creative industries, um, the life sciences, technical, technology and manufacturing businesses, logistics. Um, logistics is becoming a bigger and bigger issue in economic development for a whole lot of reasons. You know, these are business, these are business types that you probably could have a lot of success bringing into your community if you kind of can bring into better balance those issues that I referred to that might be constraints against um, economic growth. We talk, we will be talking, and when you see the report, this will all make sense to you, but it's never just about, oh, we want life science businesses, so let's go out and recruit them. You have to look at what they need, and you have to figure out, do we have it? Because if, if, they, if you don't have the sort of supply sources, the, the support sources for a particular industry, they don't need to come here because they'll go somewhere else that has it. So economic development is not just about getting businesses. It's about the whole, how are you building a structure of an economy that's durable? So target industries is helpful to know, but only if you're actually going to focus on, on, on the full depth of what that means. Supply sources, support sources. Um, you know, to have a strategy for economic development, there are things that you, you need. Um, detailed building inventory, it really needs to be known 
what do you have in this town that's vacant, available, likely to be available, where a lease is running out, what's the price of the space? Industry roundtables, I think, would be very helpful to this community. I think there's a lot that could be learned from both sides. The employers perhaps understanding more about what the constraints are on government as well as government understanding the needs of businesses. The post-secondary education partnerships, which I know you're already working on here, and that's a very important thing to do. Kind of quality of life marketing is important for a town like this because you do offer so much. Support for local entrepreneurs as well. One of the things that we find in affluent communities like yours is that there are a lot of people who have either full or part-time self-employment. It's just the nature of being a more affluent community. Understanding, understanding who the self-employed people are in your town is really important. They may not be generating industrial and commercial tax revenue, but they're working in your town. And they're gonna shop in your town during the day. They're gonna have lunch in your town if they can find a place to go. And they have the potential to become the next business. So really understanding your self-employment base is a very important part of growing an economy. And um, I think it would be helpful to all of to, to your town to know more about the self-employed people who are here, all are part of the work week. Uh, a live and work and play assessment and kind of strategies for how to get there. It's one thing to have amenities in your community. It's another thing to have them accessible to where the workers are. And then focusing on the supply chain and support services, as I said, for target industries. Um, I think that there are things that, that probably need to be looked at here sooner than later. Uh, one is just, there's a lot of, I think, traditional perspective in this community about both economic development and housing. Very, what I would call very traditional perspective. Um, the cost of land is a factor here. Um, there are structural divisions that I think would be helpful to, to the community if they were looked at and maybe tried to, uh, to re reduce some of those divisions. Leadership is key. Nothing happens without good leadership. Um, infrastructure and services, to the extent that the community can address some of those infrastructure issues, I think it will probably hold you in better stead for growing the kind of economy that at least Act in 2020 indicates that you want. Career and technical education, relationships, again, I know you're working on this. Um, communications and technology, I, I just think is a big issue here. And then government business relationships, improving what those, those are. And I, I wanna just make it clear, none of the businesses we spoke with were sort of bashing the town of Acton. It's not like that at all. There are people have, people have concerns. But there's also a sense of, this is a really great town, there's a lot of good stuff here, and we always appreciate it when someone kind of comes to our defense as an employer, but things could be better. So I want to talk a little bit about opportunities and best practices. Again, around the realm of communicate, cooperate, and collaborate. Building an economic development and housing bridge, I think really needs some work here. I think it needs leadership. Um, on this particular point, I think the town is behind virtually all of its competing communities and its peer group. Make it easy to find information on your website. I can't stress this enough. The people who are doing site, site searches and trying to get information about kind of just what you are and who you are and who do I contact for economic development information or housing information for that matter, they are not gonna poke and poke and poke through the website. It's not your average company CEO that's doing this work. It's young people who are techies. And your website is really weak. I discovered early on uh, when I tried to, to just find um, just the economic development office. I did a search for economic development and what comes up is the committee, which is great. But unless you know that the, that the economic development director's title is actually the land use director, you're not gonna find it. So these kind of things really just, these are easy fixes. These are such easy fixes. You have, you have a very talented economic development director here, but nobody can find them unless you make it possible for them to do that. Other communities that are competing also for employment, employers, do a pretty good job trying to get communication out. Here's who you go to if you're looking for information about economic development. Um, there, are, there are private organizations, there are public organizations. Here's who you contact. Um, some communities in Massachusetts have established what we call site finder systems, which are fairly elaborate databases of the property that's available in your town for commercial or industrial development. It might be vacant land, it might be vacant buildings. Um, the brokers, the realtors, the property owners have access to the database. They can post their availability on the database. So then when 
when this guy <laughs> is always trying to find information, they can go to the site finder and enter kind of what they're looking for. I'm looking for, you know, an acre of land with, with water or something, and, and I want to be within two miles of a highway. Poof, a, a list of properties comes up. And so now you kind of can start to focus in on those properties and you can get really a rich arrangement of demographic data, um, trend, you know, what the travel times are to perhaps the nearest gym, work, you know, supermarket or whatever. I mean, it's a lot of stuff that goes into these. And yes, there is a lot of effort to set it up and a lot of training time that needs to be done with your you know, real estate community. But that's a way of a community saying, we really want businesses to consider coming to our town. And so we've made it really easy for you to find property leads uh, here. Um, some towns have interesting economic development organizations. Needham and Shrewsbury come to mind as two communities that have created kind of interesting economic development entities. Uh, one being a, a, an economic development and industrial corporation, which gets very involved in kind of real estate transactions to promote the type of development the community wants to see. Um, the other is a, um, a council of economic advisors that works really directly with the town manager and the economic development uh, administrator and tries to sort of inform economic policy at a very high level. Knowing your existing for-profit and non-profit employers is really important. I think a target in this business for public economic development directors is a visitation of at least about three businesses a week. Uh, again, that kind of walking in, understanding what the business does. How long have you been here? Are you going to stay? Are you thinking about leaving? You know, what can we do to be more helpful to you? You begin to get a sense of what the business community is beyond the data. There's now a face, there's a name, there's a re relationship. It's about relationship building. Visiting every new employer, no matter how small they are, um, is just a standard part of this business. Helping businesses understand and work through permitting, and I know you're trying to do that already, so I commend you for that. Um, helping staff understand a business perspective, which often when we're in government, we've got a lot of pressures and we're trying to get things done. It's hard sometimes to understand there's a customer out there that needs a quick inspection or needs a consistent inspection, needs to know that the next time the inspector comes out, you're not going to get a different answer. So helping staff understand the business perspective. And having kind of someone who really functions as an ambassador for town hall out to the business community is just a very important function in this field. You know, what makes a partnership work, whether it's really for housing or economic development, but leadership is key. I can't, I just, there's no other explanation for this. It's about leadership. Having a common understanding of where the parties in the partnership are coming from. What is it that the housing people need? What is it that the housing people are trying to do? How can the housing people work more effectively with the economic development folks and vice versa? A willingness to learn. Things change in these fields all the time and an ability to have an open dialogue is helpful to everybody. Um, including all the key stakeholders matters and then providing mutual support when it gets politically difficult to do so strengthens a partnership. Um, I think the overarching me message, as I said for this, is this concept of communicating better, cooperating with each other, and working collaboratively. Um, it, it, is, it is the number one need we heard throughout this process over the last 15 months. And then just kind of a little looking at here of just how, I just want you to know this is a widespread, big conversation that's going on about how can uh, economic development leaders and business leaders work more successfully on the housing side and how do we enlist um, those folks in support of the housing agenda and how do we get the housing people to understand it's not just all about 40B. Um, I'm very active in the South Shore Chamber of Commerce which has been kind of a leader in a regional effort in trying to get the business world to understand what's going on with housing on the South Shore and how housing is really an impediment to economic growth. I want to just leave you with a couple of thoughts. Um, these guys are in a huddle. I think it would behoove um, the leadership in your community that's working on housing and planning and economic development to get in a huddle. I think communication here among all of you could be so much better and be so much more effective, but you've got to talk. There isn't any other answer to the, there's no other solution. People have got to communicate and understand where each other's coming from, I think, better than you do. And there's nothing better than a huddle. I've done 26 master plans in my day of municipalities. And every time I start a new one, which I'm about to do now, 
people say, how do we keep our master plan from falling, from sitting on a shelf? You hear it all the time. And I've come to the conclusion that the only reason a master plan sits on a shelf is that communities let it happen. So I would encourage all of you to think about how do you reinvigorate your efforts to implement Act in 2020 or update it or whatever it is that you need to do so that your economic development folks get the best they can get out of their efforts to grow an economy and your housing folks get the housing needs that exist in this town and in the communities around you addressed in the most effective way possible and everybody comes out feeling good about their town. I think with that, if you want to grab cards or questions or anything, I'm happy to respond to any questions that people may have. Thank you for doing that. Yes, go ahead. You can share the mic. Sure. Or oh, you can oh, have sure. your own mic. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Whatever you want to do is fine. Okay. So the first question is, how do leakage figures relate to the increasing share of consumer dollars going to online retail? Oh, that's certainly part of it. I mean, online retail is a reality. Um, but the question is, then, how do you continue to compete to provide the local sort of, you know, service-enriched retail that people say they want even as they're going on Amazon's website and, and purchasing online. I mean, it's a factor. It's not going to go away. So the, the, the follow-up question, you kind of talked about Amazon. It was, in other words, what has Amazon, you know, what has their impact been on all of this? I don't know if you... Oh, I'm sure there's plenty of industry literature that gets specific on what the impact of Amazon and Wayfair and industries like, you know, uh, retail sales like that um, have done. Um, you know, if you want me to address that in the report, I can. I don't have those numbers off the top of my head, but I can absolutely assure you that is part of what's going on with leakage. It's not just that people aren't in your community, it's even when they get home at night, they're still going on the Amazon website and buying stuff. I, just as an anecdote, uh, one of the things I've noticed in uh, the last probably 20 years in working a lot on housing stuff is that rental developers today when they talk about their projects and they're presenting them to planning boards or board of appeals, they all talk rather proudly about the fact that they have space built into the first floor or at the parking level subgrade where food deliveries can be brought, where Amazon trucks can go because people are buying stuff and there has to be a way for those deliveries to come when people are not home. So even the sort of design of housing is, accommodating, is, is recognizing and accommodating this world of online retail. Um, so the next looks like it's a comment. There's one question in the middle of it. I'll read the question first and then maybe give the comment after. So it looks like the question is, how can we have faith in your results when the outcome was determined before you started the work? <laughs> Baker's plan does not, well, that, that goes into the next comment, but I'll let you answer that. Okay. And then I'll get to the comment. This has been a part of this problem all, a problem with this project all along, is this suspicion that somehow we were hired to come in and, and give a preconceived answer. And I don't know, it doesn't really matter where the question comes from, but I have to tell you this is probably one of the two times in my entire career where I've been hired by a town to do a study and had to contend with stuff like this. Shall I read the full right comment? Okay, so there's a right full ahead. comment, a um, couple comments that came along with that. I'll read, read that. Um, it says, the scope of your work, uh, the scope of work for your assignment specifically calls for you to show that more housing density is required to have businesses in Acton. The scope even called for you to help find new voters who don't normally go to town meeting to vote um, for high density, for more high density housing. Um, and then the question was, how can we have faith in your results when the outcome was determined before you started the work? Baker's plan does not care about us. It just wants more development. Um, the second comment was the town has not analyzed the capacity of its um, roads to determine how much housing it can support without um, widening more roads. Did you, did you want to make any comments on that? No, I don't have any comments on this. Okay. Uh, market demand is not a public obligation. Why would we spend precious community resources for something we do not need? 
Um, the next question is um, Act in Vocational Schools, Minuteman Vocational Tech, new building integration opening September 1st, 2011. Disagree that we do not have access to vocational schools, was the comment. I think the issue is more the building the partnerships with those entities, not that you don't have them. Um, what we find in interviews with employers is that it is hard to find people who work in, um, in fields that are not necessarily college degree fields, that, uh, that some of the trades, the sort of really very good and very high paying jobs are hard to fill in communities like this because these communities are very college focused. That's really what the comment is. It's not that you don't have access to vocational and educational programming. It's building the partnerships with those entities. Okay, it looks like there is maybe a couple comments, um, maybe a few questions. Um, what is your idea of affluent community? Um, Acton has less than 25% of high paying jobs. Acton has very little indus industrialized tax base. People go, um, to act in creating heavy traffic in town. We pay very high real estate taxes and get low quality services. I lived here for over 30 years, seen population tripled in the time, and have lot size shrank by a, three, by a third. Quality of housing is poor. Sorry, it seemed like there was no question, so. Um, how do leak it, oh, and then we got to the next one again, okay. I think okay. that was it. Are there any other questions? Uh, okay, so 21% of local employees live in Acton. Why is this bad? What is a good number and why? It isn't so much that it's bad. The point is that if the employment base composition and the labor force composition are as, are as out of alignment as they appear to be here, it just raises the question of do people who live in the community have a range of choices available to work locally as opposed to having to commute elsewhere. So that's just one consideration. And another issue is that the more you lose people to non-local jobs, the more you lose some consumer spending to other markets because people will do a certain amount of their shopping closer to where they work. So it, it, there's this economic development question that I think you want to look at. But I mean, I just want to make it clear, you're not the only town that has a fairly low percentage of people working locally, but it's just something to look at. It's a low figure. It's up to you. Okay. I was actually thinking about that. Why not take a look at what the people that do not work in Acton do and see if there is any specific type of job that they would consider going, you know, taking in Acton if it existed. Have you done that? That was one of the charts that we put up here. There was a comparison of what kinds of jobs people do who are part of the labor force. Mm -hmm. yep. It'll be easier, sorry. There, um, there will be a full report that, that Judy will be um, releasing that will be posted online and the presentation will also be posted on the town's website as well. Um, so I'm not sure if, um, we're trying to get Judy out of here around nine. So I'm just trying to be cognizant of her time. I didn't see anything about tax bills in your analysis of Acton versus other communities. Do you have that information? You're talking about tax rates? No, tax bills. You mean residential tax bills? Yes. Oh, not in this presentation, no, but we certainly looked at it. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, yeah, um, so I just want to thank, um, thank Judy, thank all of the boards and committees that have assisted um, with this process, and thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, again, I mentioned that um, the presentation will be online soon, and um, we'll also have the final 
um, document and findings and recommendations from Judy later on and hope to work with everyone um, you know, in the next year and, and onward on communicating, collaborating, and um, cooperating. cooperating. So um, thank you all very much. Thank you.